welcome to the podcast where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward and now your host adam posner Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast, where I bring you the best and brightest from the world of business, marketing, politics, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity to drive your career forward. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 99th episode of the podcast, and I am proud and humbled to introduce my guest, the 55th governor of the state of New York, David Patterson. Governor David Patterson is a member of the Democratic Party who served as the 55th governor of New York, and he's the first African-American to serve as governor of New York. Governor Patterson overcame severe disability and racial prejudice to become a state senator, lieutenant governor, and unexpectedly, governor of New York. Governor, I had the honor to receive an advanced copy of this book, and it's filled with stories of conspiracies of improbability, stories of how he overcame his disability and adversity, and how at times both had held him back. And this is a self-help book encapsulated from the memories of one who continues to help himself through his service to others. I'm excited to dive in deep with the governor today. I am thrilled to welcome the 55th governor of my great state in New York, Governor David Patterson. Welcome to the show. Well, Adam, I don't think I've ever been interviewed by someone who was born in the same borough as myself. Really? So somehow, somewhere, I should have met you before. I can only assume that you can do lots and lots of interviews around this book. What I really want to focus today on is a couple of really core relevant topics. Racism, COVID and adversity. Today is June 19th, 2020, and it's a day to celebrate the end of slavery, but not the end of racism. I would like to start off with talking about the chapters in your book around racism and slavery and the late addition that you're adding to it around the George Floyd murder. I'm going to read an excerpt from the book. Sometimes when there is a racial strife, there becomes a counter reaction to it. And in that moment, most of the members of the oppressive group become simpatico with what has happened. And then you go on to quote someone that you deeply respect and admire, Deepak Chopra. In the end, we are all the same. In the end, we are all capable of doing what the evilest of us have done. We're also capable of doing what the most virtuous have done. Colors, preferences, and regions only separate us in a physical way, but in the end, we are all the same. Salute the people you admire because you are just like them and learn to love your enemies because you act like them too. That really resonated with me, especially in these times. I'd love if you could unpack and talk to us a little bit about what you call the new racism. Well, the new racism, as I put it, takes no responsibility, denies the existence of racism itself, and it doesn't fathom that there is actually inequality in this country. And one very good example of it is recently President Trump refused the military's desire to change the names of 12 bases from Southern Confederates to other American heroes. Now, the Southern Confederates were never really American. They seceded from the Union. They were basically going against the United States. For some reason, after the Civil War and the seceded states being inducted back into the Union, the North respected these generals. The Civil War, by my count, Adam, was from 1861 to 1865. We fought all of World War II, and I don't think we put the names of 12 generals on any bases. But for some reason, there was this accession that the North made to the South. They always accepted the Southern story of how Memorial Day began when it was actually African Americans who started Memorial Day in 1865. All throughout our history as Americans, we never seem to take responsibility for our fault. We are a great nation. Everyone always says we, but when we start talking about racism, it's not we. I don't know anything about those people. I didn't do it. I don't even know if it was members of my family that did it. Yes, they are. And that's the beginning of the problem, the failure to acknowledge responsibility. In South Africa, within two years of Nelson Mandela becoming president, they had the famous hearings where they had a re-engagement of the South Africans with each other, where the whites talked about the way they thought the world should have been until apartheid was disrupted. And the blacks let the whites know how deeply and negatively the apartheid conditions affected them and their families. South Africa has gone far beyond their apartheid state in just 30 years, while the United States continues to languish because we don't recognize what we did to black people the way the Germans have gone out of their way to separate themselves from the treatment, the Holocaust in World War II. I think that we need to listen. I think everybody needs to listen. But why do you think so many people are having difficulty separating the concept of black lives matter versus all lives matter? 
Franz Fanon, the author, wrote a book, White Man Listen. His words would be very important now. But I think as a black man, I can listen and understand why it's not happening. Let's take the relationship between Americans and the police department. In most neighborhoods and most communities, the police are not just the people with blue suits and badges who ride around in police cars and protect you. They're your neighbors. They're the people who you see at the bowling alley. They're the people who are Cub Scout leaders and Little League coaches. They're deacons at the church. They're always ready. If you have a problem, you need to discuss it, they'll stop in the street and discuss it with you. They inherit the great reputations that not only they have, but very many police officers are descendants of other police officers, and that's all fine. But what too many white Americans don't understand is that those same people who are covered with valor when they live in their own neighborhoods bought into a stereotypical description and analysis of the black community in which even in the high crime areas only 10 to 12 percent of the people were involved so meanwhile they're alienating 88 to 90 percent of the citizens there by stopping them by yelling at them by mistreating them by never speaking to them even when the person asks the officer for assistance there's no response naming the police precincts Fort Apache of the Bronx, as they did in the 44th Precinct in the Bronx years ago, acting as if they are going to preside over slaves or captured Indians or prisoners of war when they are actually other Americans who happen to be black, who live in a neighborhood different than yours. And then when they get the negative reaction that they get from the black public, accuse them of lawlessness and being un-American and being radicals. What is so radical about fighting back when you haven't been treated right by one of the agencies of your own country. Exactly. And enough is enough. And I think that's what everyone needs to understand. This isn't just one murder. This isn't just George Floyd. It's not about George Floyd. It's been what's happening for centuries in this country here. And enough is enough. And I think that is what a lot of white people don't understand. We have to come to a common ground. Do you think this is going to be the impetus for real change? Or are we just stuck in this vicious cycle? Well, I'm conducting this interview right now from... 115th Street and Frederick Douglass Boulevard, which used to be 8th Avenue. About 56 years ago, it was around this time of year, the epicenter of one of the major riots that occurred for six days. The riots were so bad that Dr. Martin Luther King eschewed the opportunity to come in and try to stop them. It happened when a 15-year-old boy by the name of James Powell opened up a fire hydrant when the policeman pulled his gun, Powell ran away, and the policeman shot him in the back. When he went over to see if Powell had survived, he kicked the body and rolled it over to see whether or not Powell was still alive, and that ignited one of the worst riots in American history. So I have seen this type of unrest on television, not in person, but I would say there's something different about this situation, the eight minutes and 46 second knee on the neck of George Floyd. And that is the diversity of the protesters, Asians, along with blacks, Hispanics and whites, young people, older people, people who actually say that they're conservative have come out and protested. Sooner or later, you hope that there would be an incident where finally society as a whole said enough. The Eric Garner strangling by Danny Pantaleo, a police officer who had had several misconduct violations, and the department did nothing about it, and neither did the grand jury, but was finally fired for the police department. That should have been the incident back in 2014. Right. But it wasn't. So what I'm saying is I feel, as Joan Baez and Bob Dylan would say, something blowing in the wind. And I think it's that our society realizes it's hurting itself in so many ways because it hasn't addressed this issue. And by the way, I don't see this issue as bad eggs or bad apples or whatever they call it in the police department. I feel it is an organized set of directives used by the police that absolutely has to be changed. I want to talk about the concept of defund the police. And I've literally had to have the conversation with people. We're not demanding the police here. There's still going to be police, but it's changing the idea of how the police are funded or, you know, maybe for a nonviolent 911 call, sending a crisis counselor, like if it's a potential suicide threat or domestic violence or things like that. What are your thoughts on this defund the police movement? 
Well, one of Dr. Martin Luther King's most famous quotes was, you can tell where a nation's heart is by where it invests its money. So if the problem is the police, and I think most of the protesters feel that it is, we need to invest money in the police department. We need to put people in decision-making capacity who are not following traditions that their great-grandfather followed when he was in the police. We need to put measures in the police department restricting the police force when one is apprehended and unable to defend themselves anymore. That's going to take actually more money. Shrill cries of let's defund the police is like, let's get back at the police. We're going to cut their budget. Now they're not even going to have uniforms. They're going to have to walk around in jumpsuits. That is for those who are always retaliating, but really have an ignorance or a misunderstanding of what would make our communities better. The majority of people on those picket lines, they want to walk down the street in peace and they want to love their police officers because those are the people who protect them. That's how people in other communities feel about the police and the police deserved it in other communities, but did not transform that same type of conduct into Harlem, Bedford-Stuyvesant, the South Bronx, and the Harlems all around the United States. Yeah, it's a fantastic perspective, and I deeply appreciate that. I was watching a recent piece on CNN where they were talking about the turnaround in Camden, New Jersey, and the approaches they took there. And I forgot what the exact statistic was, but it was a very, very small percentage of the police that actually lived in that community. They had no sense of who the people really were, and that's what drew the great divide. Let's talk about New York City. I see police being vilified. I see outright blatant attacks on police. How is this going to come to an end? Well, this is where I have a lot of sympathy for the police officers themselves. They are just following the policies. They are just working in a system that they were used to and maybe their uncle or father were used to or big brother from years ago. To vent your anger at the watchdog outside when your problem is with the owner of the house is really not getting us anywhere in all right is having workers attack other workers, which is not what we need. What we need is strong leadership from the executive level. So when the New York Police Department very recently got rid of their community policing, where the cops ran around in plain clothes and started arresting people, when you start grabbing people in the community and you're in plain clothes, they don't think you're the police, they think you're the muggers, or they think you're the mob. Civilians got hurt because the system of policing failed. Just very recently, There was a vendor, he was barbecuing food, and he was selling it, and he obviously didn't have a license, and I happened to be buying some of the food when the police came up to talk to him. The officer said to him, sir, you need a permit to be a vendor here, so we have the forms with us. If you fill them out, we'll hand them in for you, and we'll let you stay today, but you can't come back until you get your license, and that should take about a week. He tried to give the police free food after that. There is a way to police communities without having antagonism. You have very high regard for your successor, Governor Andrew Cuomo, his response and action to COVID. In the chapter, Presidential Affairs, you quote Governor Cuomo, the best that can be said of any public servant is that they are willing to learn and grow. And we are seeing this right before our eyes in the most difficult times. You're probably the only person I could ask this question to. Still have the same opinion of our current governor, and how would you have handled it differently? The COVID crisis? Correct. I wish I could have matched his record because when he went on television, he didn't just talk about how many deaths there were and keep your mask on. He got into the personal aspect of having to stay in the home, of having to explain this to small children. He used examples from his Italian family and what his grandfather said. He translated that into English. And you had the feeling after a while, you're just sitting talking to a friend who's helping you get through this crisis. I told Vanity Fair in an interview, they should take Dr. Phil off and let Andrew talk for an hour every day. (laughs) He's more interesting than Dr. Phil anytime. I think that he was very strong on the issue of how New York has gotten through this crisis where other states are starting to see increases in the infections. I think he has addressed the issue of COVID and the protests. He's saying, listen, I don't have a problem with the protests, but can't you do a Zoom protest because you're just going to affect each other? But unfortunately, if there's one thing that I'd say the left and the right proved during COVID virus is neither has any regard for authoritarian demand when it comes to wearing masks. Personally, I think he did a great job of showing what leadership should look like from a communication standpoint. I mean, listen, there were mistakes made, as you said in the post the other day about his response to the nursing homes, but that's a difficult situation for anybody to be in. To have to make that call, would you have made the same call? 
Look, it was so difficult that I didn't understand it when I was even talking about it because I was fortunate enough that I didn't have a pandemic when I was governor. And I never read the section of the health law that said that the nursing homes cannot admit a patient that they don't think they can treat or could be a harm to others. So I don't know how they wound up doing that, but I realized that it wasn't the governor who was the final word on that. It was the law, and apparently they didn't follow it. But what I would say generally is that there's so many issues that come up, and I think, quite frankly, Governor Cuomo has now been identified as a potential presidential candidate in 2004, whether he thinks so or not. I think that people around him would recognize that that's the case. And since it is, they had been looking to get him on something because President Trump and Mayor de Blasio, who were both appearing every day, were just making one gap after the other. The governor just seemed to cruise through them. And whenever you are considered to be the one who's getting it right when everyone else is wrong, you become a target. So moving on to what I think is one of the core themes of this book is overcoming adversity. It's something that you, since the day you were born and you recognize that something wasn't right with your vision, I'd love to talk about, you know, you have reached the highest of career success despite all these disabilities and racial prejudices. Let's talk about how blindness has held you back. I think from communication, you go to the library, you get a book, you do research. When I went to the library, when I was fortunate, someone would go with me, a two person job of trying to research takes three or four times longer than a one-person job. That was a problem when I was younger. I couldn't read the newspapers. I just felt that I was isolated from information. I grew up listening to radio, and I wound up doing a radio program later in life because it was the only way I could get information at that particular time. My mother and father could not have tried harder. There were school officials that tried hard, but the biggest mistake that was made in my education is I should have learned Braille. In the early 60s, the sociologists, who might as well have been sociopaths, decided that you didn't need Braille. One of the interesting issues of disability is the socialization of disabled people. So when somebody walks around with a white cane to the regular society, they look helpless, they look blind, and all of the stereotypes that comes with it, so the idea is when a blind person would start reading Braille, you would notice that. But if a blind person was just listening to a cassette or a vinyl record, now they're basically normalized. Special education teachers would tell the teachers in my classroom, just be patient with him. He's just like everyone else. I'm not just like everyone else, so they wouldn't have had a special education teacher. When you are different, you tend to look at the world through a different prism. So for instance, when I was younger, I was a very outgoing person. It went up and talked to people and that kind of thing. But as I got older, I would walk up and talk to people and realize that wasn't who I thought it was. What held me back the most was access to information and also access to travel. So for instance, one of the reasons I moved to New York City and will never move out of here is New York City has a subway. You don't have to drive. I don't have to drive. And I don't like buses because every time I get on the bus, I'll say, is this the three bus? And the bus driver will say, what does the sign say? And I'll say, if I could read the sign, I wouldn't be asking you. But it held you back from taking the bar exam. Do you regret that? Yeah, there was no way under the circumstances that existed that time. And actually from 1982 to 1990, no blind or sight impaired person passed the New York State bar exam. I think they've changed a lot of the rules. I guess I could go back and take it now, but I found other ways to uh, make a living. I believe so. But even for shits and giggles, wouldn't you like to try to take it? Well, I recently passed the Series 7 securities exam, which I heard is the bar exam for finance. I think that's enough. I want to shift and talk about some stories, some themes in the book. I love the story. I think was it 1994? Was it the gay games in Greenwich Village? You were playing with then Governor Mario Cuomo against the Swedish team. And I was fascinated to hear two things. One, how good you are at basketball. And even more impressively, Governor Cuomo at basketball. That's a fantastic story. Well, Governor Cuomo played basketball with his sons. He loved basketball. He was actually a semi-pro baseball player at one time, but he loved basketball. And when we played in the game, I told him if he grabbed a rebound and threw it down court, I knew I was the fastest person there. So I would either get to the ball or just go out of bounds. And he granted my wish and he threw it so perfectly. I actually could have caught it, but I was so nervous that I would drop it. I let it bounce once and I tried to lay it up and somebody ran into me going full speed. And I was only able to flip the ball as I'm falling down and the ball bounced off the backboard and went in. And that shocked the whole group of people who were watching this game. A CBS reporter came up and told me that but you're legally blind. How, how did you make that shot? And I looked in the camera and I said, 
Well, I guess I got over it. I just knew. <laughs> I just knew I was going to see that. But as I write in the book, when I went home to watch it on TV, that was the night that O.J. Simpson drove up the highway in the white Bronco. And if I were one of the police that night, I would have killed him. That was your one chance, Governor. That was your one chance for fame. I don't know what we're going to do about that. I'm going to mention a name, a place, a time, a core event throughout the book. And I'd love if you could just give me a couple of quick thoughts. Sure. Let's start off with Muhammad Ali. Well, Muhammad Ali shook my hand right before an apartheid rally in June of 1986. The problem was I didn't recognize him and just said, hi, nice to meet you and walked away. <laughs> Apparently, he had the most puzzled, chagrined look on his face until David Dinkins, who would eventually become the first black mayor of New York City, explained to him that I probably didn't recognize him. And Ali came over and had me march right next to him. And it was the thrill of my life. And I love that story because it says so much about him, how he kept marching, even though he was getting exhausted and he kept on persevering and he kept on pushing through. But I'm sure that moment had such an incredible impact from the point of perseverance. It was amazing. At first, he had his arm around me I felt like I was the prom date because he's he, a lot bigger than you <laughs> he felt so bad that he made fun of me and then he realized that I didn't recognize him he started to lean on me and after a while he was completely leaning on me and I think he weighed about 280 pounds at the time Jeez. I probably weighed soaking wet 145 pounds but I wouldn't get out of the parade either because even though I was beat red there was no way I was going to let go they were going to carry me out and then I had this thought so here I am battling it out with Muhammad Ali. And the question is, who's going to go first? I mean, who has stories like this? When President Obama told you not to run for governor again? I think there were a lot of actors in that play, and President Obama was certainly involved in it. I never got that President Obama had the slightest good feeling toward me. When he first was running for president, he made all of the black congressional leaders get up and endorse him the day before our candidate, Hillary Clinton, was getting out of the race, which I thought was a cheap shot. Ship, look, she's getting out of the race, and then we're with you. I called him up and told him that I thought what it was. I said, not only that, Mr. President, but 43% of all the money that's raised in presidential campaigns comes from New York. And half of the people who are giving that money are women, and they feel that the old boys network beat out racism, that the men were more willing to work with President Obama than with Secretary Clinton. And I said to him, who do you think is going to go and convince these women that we're all one party, one Democratic party, and we've got to elect President Obama, and there'll be time when we'll elect a woman president? And he said, well, I guess that would be you. And I said, obviously, because I'm the governor of the state of New York. And he said, you know, I never thought about that. And I said, Right now, I don't think you're thinking about a lot of things. And I think that was the kiss of death right there. I went to the White House. He signed a health care bill. And I was introduced to Michelle Obama. And she was very warm and very outgoing. And she says, Barack, have you met the governor? And he looked at me and he goes, yes. He went back to doing what he was doing. Jeez. President Obama kind of reminded me of the people you work with in the movie theater. And then one becomes the manager. Then everybody else is in trouble because I wasn't the only African-American elected official who he seemed to want to impress hmm. others on the outside that he could be as hard on like people as he was on anybody else. But actually, I don't know any white Democrats who he particularly annoyed. Ronald Galella was a defendant in a case where he was found by the judges not to be fit for trial. He was found by psychiatrists not to be fit for trial. We were going in to sanction that and to send him to a mental hospital. But my boss, Alfred Annenberg, decides that since it's my birthday and I've never made a court appearance in my life, that I should be the one to take the case up to the judges. And then because he seemed to think that I was going to be a very good lawyer. See, I was practicing law under supervision, even though I didn't have a license. He filled the courtroom with, you know, friends of his. And he says, and I'm going to bring some friends of yours, which meant the black people in the office. And they're all watching what would normally be a two-minute formality. Procedural. And so I, nervous as I was, the first time I was ever in court, I got up and I told the judge that Mr. Galel is not fit for trial. And the defense agreed, as I heard they would agree. And then they said, but Your Honor, uh, Mr. Galella has written a letter and he would like you to read it. So they pass the letter up to the judge who reads the letter and hands it back to the defense attorney. And then I realized that my boss, even though I was only there six weeks, he hammered this into our heads that whenever the defense and the judge see something, we must see it. So I stepped in the direction of the court clerk and I said, by the way, I'd like to take a look at that letter. He reacted as if I was from Mars. You want to look at the letter? 
I'm thinking that my blindness, everyone in the courthouse seems to know that now. And I said, as my boss had instructed me not to get pushed around, I said, you know, I speak the English language. I seem you do too. So I asked you for the letter and I'd like you to hand it to me and hand it to me now. So he hands me the letter, he's real agitated. Now, I can't read the letter, and I know I can't read the letter, but I don't think the people in the courtroom know how much I can see. So I just hold the letter up and I just keep moving it around. I see the hand, the court clerk tries to take it away. I take the letter back. He says, you're holding up the cases. I said, no, you're holding up the cases because I have a right to read this letter. And when I'm done, we can do the other cases. So once again, he's, he's real upset. And I keep kind of reading the letter, but I hear this murmur all over the courtroom like something has gone terribly wrong. And this other lawyer who, 25 years later, I would appoint to be a judge when I was governor, walks up to me and he says, David, please give them back the letter. <laughs> Mr. Galella's insane. You're not reading a letter. He just wrote the letter G up and down the page. <laughs> the last three minutes, you've been reading a page full of G's. <laughs> I take the letter and I pass it up, my hand shaking. The court rips it away and now. He victoriously scowls at me, and the judge looks down from his vantage point and says, the only thing I found more profound in this letter was the prosecutor's appreciation for it, and the whole courtroom fell out laughing. What does it feel, that embrace, when President Clinton hugs you? It feels like you're having an affair with President Clinton. You know? <laughs> he has such warmth and sincerity, and I know that, you know, a lot of things he says are questioned and that kind of thing, but he really, as a human being, has compassion for other human beings. We all make mistakes, we all have our ups and downs, but it comes across, and I think what's so interesting is that the legend is he has this effect on women, but he also has it on men. I remember that my chief of staff and I went to his office to get some suggestions from him on what I should do when I left office, and when we left, we're sitting there having a drink and my former chief of staff Charles O'Byrne said to me you know when you have a meeting with Bill Clinton you need to relax about an hour and a half before you think of what he actually said because everything that he says sounds right towards the end of the book you talk about that you're about to go on air during the Newtown school shooting how did that resonate with you it was historic and I knew it was going to be historic my show started at 4 p.m. and I went on at 2 p.m went on early, we decided to go live. They, at the time, were reporting that two people had been killed and two wounded. But from the reaction of law enforcement and the failure to disclose information for two or three hours, I said to the audience, my fear, and trust me, I think this is right, is that there are far more injuries and deaths in that school and this day is not going to end well. And sure enough, by four o'clock, when President Obama made the announcement, even he himself was in tears over what happened at that massacre. And it was a challenge to maintain equilibrium and to do that show. And I wound up doing it for five hours that day until someone relieved me. Yeah, and I hope to God that we never have to live through that again. I have an eight-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son, and literally it's that, that deep down fear every day. And our house is back to back with the elementary school. And it's just something that deep down inside, I pray that that will never happen. Complete 180 switch here on the next one. I love the Denzel Washington story. Would you mind sharing that? I was meeting a business partner and I was being introduced to someone and I put the meeting at a restaurant in Harlem, which didn't have too much activity. So I thought we'd get a chance to really sit down and talk. When I tried to get members of the group that I had dinner with to come with me, no one wanted to come. And I've always had this apprehension about walking into bars by myself. For some reason, it bothers me even to this day. And I walk in, I sit right at the edge of the bar, almost as if, if anything happens, I'm right out the door. Guy comes in, he throws his arms out. He says, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. He says, what are you doing these days? And I said, I'm, I'm consulting. And I'm um, thinking, now there will be a pitch here, either for a job or a recommendation. And then he offers to buy me a drink. So I said, well, you know what? He buys me a drink. I guess I'll listen, yeah. sit around. We're just chatting about different things. Very friendly. And in comes my business partner. It was a woman who I always thought was quite disaffected. I never knew too much about her. I didn't know that she was married or single. She comes up and she says hello to me. She introduces me to the gentleman that whose hand I shake. And then she's staring at my companion at the bar. And she walks up to him and she says, good evening. I'm Jung Yoon. And he turns around and puts his hand out and he says, good evening, I'm Denzel Washington. And I'm like, I can't believe this. I start to say, I didn't even know it was you, but I thought, 
I don't have to say that. I can sit here and act like I knew that all along. So I sit there and act that way. And finally, someone else, a restaurateur in Harlem, who we know very well, came in. And he was meeting Denzel, and they went in the back, and they sat down to have drinks. And the woman says to me, so, uh, Governor, this is your jet set life? You hang out every night with Denzel Washington? I said, no way. No way. Denzel and I get together every couple of months or so. <laughs> and that's something I really love in the book. And it goes from deep, deep stuff like the Newton School shooting to these are your everyday happenings. Are you a Mets fan? Yes. I really enjoyed reading the piece on Trump because it just says so much about his history. What are your thoughts on the president? He understands the public. He is a promoter. And this idea that he's this great businessman who's, who's working at politics is upside down. I think even his own supporters should think about this. He was a terrible businessman. He went bankrupt four times. He wrecked Atlantic City. Everything he touched, there was some sort of problem with it, problems with the unions, buildings taking 10 years longer to build than they should have, him asking government to dig with government money entrances from their buildings into his, which is preposterous. But in politics, he's a genius. How do you basically defame John McCain and do it in a way that you get away with it and it builds your base? Unbelievable. How do you talk about both people in the march in Charlottesville were good people when clearly the Ku Klux Klan was out to eradicate the upward mobility of Jews and African Americans? He reads situations. He appeals to the id, not to the superego. So he's not trying to make sense of these debates when he said angry woman at Hillary Clinton. He's angry all the time. But a man's allowed to be angry in our society, and a lot of people feel strange when a woman shows anger. The nicknames. I heard Marco Rubio interviewed somewhere, and he said something that was kind of ridiculous the other night. My first thought was, little Marco. <laughs> you know, he makes it stick. And that is the art of politics. How could someone who says the things he said be elected once and I feel is the odds on candidate to be reelected again? That is a great politician. Now, he might not get into heaven, or if he does, I think I'd probably rather go to the other place. But the point is that he is a remarkable successful politician and he uses those rallies to speak to millions of people who aren't even there. You truly feel he's going to win again. Is that because of his political prowess or because Biden's not strong enough? Well, I think Biden, when he started losing the presidential primaries, he had two other times, tried to be more feisty and more provocative in his debates. And he just looked like an angry man who you see sitting at a bar somewhere. Biden's got to go back to just being a listener, making small points, demonstrating leadership, not going out on the limb, just in a sense, try to let the president beat himself because that's the only way I see that he's going to lose. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that one. I love the Queen Elizabeth story with Chris Christie. Would you mind sharing that real quick? Queen Elizabeth came to lay a wreath at the World Trade Center and Governor Christie and I are the heads of the Port Authority at the time, and that's Port Authority property. But the word was that Mayor Bloomberg, who was like the diva, was going to escort Queen Elizabeth in, whereupon the protocol office informed Mayor Bloomberg that the only person that escorts Queen Elizabeth is Prince Philip. So we then heard that Mayor Bloomberg was going to walk right past Governor Christie and I and be first in line to greet her when she comes to where the lakes are, where she was going to lay a wreath. And Governor Christie got so upset, I swore it was 98 degrees out, I could see the steam coming out of his ears. And he walked up and he says, did you hear what he's going to do? And I said, hey, he always does stuff like that. He goes, well, not this time. He says, if he tries to pass you, I want you to trip him. I said, okay. And he said, and I'll sit on it. <laughs> it's a true story. And as the years have gone by, considering Mayor Bloomberg's presidential performance, maybe it would have worked out better had he tried to pass me Fascinating when you talk about you are responsible for the quote, Miracle on the Hudson. You're not getting the residuals from that movie on that? No, but actually Tom Hanks credited me with making that remark, which was probably the first time since the day after the incident that anyone remembered who actually said that. It was revealing to get that response from a major actor like Tom Hanks. And the real story that resonated to me was you were right there. You were at the governor's office on the east side and you went directly over to the west side and you were standing there when they were bringing the folks that came off the plane in the river on the boat onto shore. And I believe there was one gentleman that came up to you apologizing for missing hearing you speak at a recent conference. 
There was a gentleman whose name was John. He worked for Alcoa, and we had had a press conference on the Monday of that week to announce some new construction that Alcoa was doing that the state was going to provide assistance. And he was either supposed to introduce me or he was supposed to be on the stage when I got there. I'm congratulating the survivors of the accident. And he was trying to get this cloth. He was wiping himself off with on his back. So I put my hand over and wiped his back off for him. He turned around and said, you know, I owe you an apology because I wasn't at the press conference. I was stuck in some place and I had to fly up to New York. I didn't get there on time. And I looked at him and I said, you just survived a plane crash in the Hudson River that is going to be historic that any of you survive. And all you can think of is apologizing to me because you were late for a meeting. He said, well, as soon as I saw you, it was the first thing that came to my mind. Years later, and I don't even know what the incident was, Adam, but I had a conference with some of the heads of Alcoa. I guess I was consulting for someone and they wanted Alcoa to do something for them. And I told them the story and they said, yeah, that's John. <laughs> He's always about the work. You're an opportunity to meet the Pope. What did you say to the Pope? Pope spoke German. So I just said hello and hope he understood the English. It was a very cold day. This is the Pope that preceded Pope Francis, who we have now. He then came to Yankee Stadium. I saw him there as well, speaking to a number of Americans. And it's always great to have a visit from the Pope. It's got to be. From your time when you were governor, is there one defining moment that stood out to you? We had a number of crises, but I thought that my decision to go on television and speak to New Yorkers, just myself, not a press conference, which my staff totally told me wouldn't work. And 86% of the networks let me go on. And I issued that warning, a warning not only to New York State, but to the whole country that we were about to experience a recession that would rival the Great Depression. I did that on July 31st of 2008. It set me up for some big criticism and some bad editorials. But then six weeks later, when the country turned around, I had sort of like that 15 minutes of fame where you're the one who called it and therefore everything you say people listen to. And I remember being on CNN one day and I was talking, a red light bulb went off in my head. All they have to do is say, Governor, would you please define what a credit default swap is? And I'm dead. Years later, I had lunch with Nouriel Rabini, Dr. Doom, one of the great economists. And I told him that story. He said, David, no one on Wall Street knew what a credit default swap meant, so you could have said anything you wanted. <laughs> and what's your favorite moment from the book? I think my exploits in the district attorney's office and learning how to practice law and learning how to interact with other people and the incident when the court officer yelled at me and told me to sit down because he thought I was the defendant and I was actually the prosecutor. And then my boss basically told him off and he wanted to kill me and my boss. And my boss was a real wild-eyed conservative. But when he saw the way that court officer treated me, there was no civil rights activist that could have gotten on that guy even more than he did. And it made me proud to work for him. Yeah, that's that's loyalty right there. And I adore your love story with your wife, Mary, and your relationship with her son, Anthony. And I've been married just past our 10-year anniversary. I have two little kids. What advice would you give me, Governor, for a long-lasting, successful marriage? Well, this is my second marriage. That's well, the first one was practice. 100 days, uh, Mary and I staying in the same place with Anthony. And that's all worked out very well. But I think that the communication sometimes on issues that you kind of overlook, but they keep coming up, that at some point you've got to talk about them. And a therapist spoke to Mary and me, suggested that you take a few minutes, half hour, 45 minutes every week, and you just talk to each other about a couple of things. And it's supposed to be a safety zone. It cannot create a fight. It's just to express points of view. And then after that, you go on and finish the day. And so far, it's worked. <laughs> Governor, what does the word authentic mean to you? I think it means real. I think you're getting the absolute truth from someone. And it's not that people lie. It's just that their insecurities make it impossible sometimes for them to really open up and to really express how they actually feel about things. And I think that's one of the nuances of this period of racial interaction based on some racial mistreatment is that people who in the past didn't want to reveal true feelings are actually revealing them. So I think a number of white people may have come to the conclusion that they're blacks who use racism as a crutch every time they don't get a job, every time this, that. It actually does happen. It's real. It actually does happen. 
But now you've had a black president, you've had three black governors of state in the past 20 years, and you have successful people, the chief of staff to the Air Force is now an African American. You can't say that. But on the other hand, a lot of black people have held back the resistance to tell their bosses how they feel about how work is done in the office and how they never really have a chance for promotion because they never really have any chance to be in any decision-making capacities. And that's also the truth. What is the single greatest piece of advice that you have ever received that you take action on every single day? I was in a campaign and it was a real difficult campaign and I was, you know, getting a lot of strife and another elected official named Ferran, Fernando Ferreira, I said, what is the one piece of advice you could give me? He said, don't take anything personal. That's tough to do. Can't always do that. It's a great platitude to try to follow. I go through the book too, and I'm like, hey, why would anybody get into politics? I mean, the amount of drama that you tell these stories, these drama, it sounds like high school drama in the state house going back and forth, switching sides and the back talk and everything. I mean, day in and day out, doesn't that just make your head want to explode? Oh, there is certainly for those who are currently in high school, there's a lot you can learn because it's going to repeat itself 40 years later. These are adults we're talking about. I mean, I remember I gave some extra money to a woman who wanted to keep an employee on staff, but the employee was terminally ill. So I gave her some extra money to hire someone else to help out. Well, somebody else found out she got the extra money and came in and demanded the same amount of money. And I said, I can't give it to you. And she said, well, why did you give it to her? And I said, I can't tell you. And she said, well, why can't you tell me? I said, because I can't. It would be immoral. Well, you're going to pay for this. I said, I, then I'll pay for it, but it'll still be immoral. And the fact that you're not accepting or respecting what I'm telling you is also immoral. And I'll make sure you pay for that. <laughs> it's pettiness at a certain point. We don't grow out of it, sadly. Governor, what would you say is your superpower? I think within five minutes of meeting people, I know exactly who they are. Now, I haven't always followed the notion. I know, but I still do things I probably shouldn't work with people I probably shouldn't work with. But I think I get a sense of who people are very quickly. There's some people, they're psychic in the sense that they can tell you something before it's going to happen. I can't do that, but I think I can tell what people have been through before they met me. That's strong. That's absolutely strong. The last hundred days, we've all been going through a lot. It's been the great equalizer and there's been some tremendous silver linings that we're all experiencing. What is the number one silver lining that you've experienced? I think the silver lining is that there are these things you're always putting off because you never had time to do them. Well, in the last hundred days, there had certainly been time to do them. And if you didn't do them by now, you know, books you were going to read, you might as well throw them out because this was the time to really go back and re-engage yourself. Activities you wanted to be involved in, movies you wanted to see. A school professor of mine when I was 19 told me to watch the movie Citizen Kane. I was gonna watch it every year until this year. 45 years later, I watched Citizen Kane. That's awesome. Towards the end of the book, you say, quote, I see my charge these days, not much as in public service, but in contributing to the reconciliation of the divine consciousness. What is next? Is this really, as you say at the end of the book, the end question mark? Well, I think that so many things are going in the wrong direction and so and the behavior of people is becoming more and more obtuse that somewhere there's a tipping point and there's going to have to be a strong spiritual togetherness that we're going to reach. Now, our biggest problem is we argue and fight over whose God is stronger and whose God is right and everyone else is wrong. And I read something once by Paulo Coelho, who was quoting a Coptic priest who in the 11th century said, people spend so much time trying to figure out the divinity rather than appreciating the great mystery that it is. I think if all of us could take a step back and do that, we would be headed in a much better direction than we are right now. Amen. And Governor, last but not least, those moments in your life when you were at your lowest and one story that resonated to me was a story when you were in law school and there was someone breaking into your house and you had to jump out the window and you're scrambling across the bridge. I think you were in Rockville Center and trying to get to the hospital across the street and other low points in your life where you really had to dig down deep when you were facing adversity and you had to pull yourself up and really harness your inner tenacity. And on the other side of that, when you want to show extreme gratitude and just thankful for everything that you have in your life and everything that you've accomplished and hold close to your heart. Governor David Patterson, what is your North Star? My North Star is the understanding that the reason I'm either going through this great tumult or the reason that I'm going through this great triumph is not all my doing. And so I shouldn't get 
too excited at the high points or too upset at the low points because there's some plan and I'm just happy to be here as long as I have been to try to figure out what it is. Thank you, Governor. I want to leave off on a couple of quotes that really resonated with me. And the first one is something that defines something that's close to my core and my DNA is that word tenacity. And to quote the governor, I have had this desire my whole life to prove people wrong, to show them I could do things they didn't think I could do. And towards the end of the chapter on your book on your governorship, you say, quote, if I could go back and do things differently, I certainly would have done so. If I could go back and try harder to do the right thing, I could not have done so. And I think that speaks volumes about your character and who you truly are. And lastly, a quote from a final story in the book that speaks to the current situation of America, quote, dawn occurs when you look into the faces of all the people around you and see them as your brothers and sisters. Until that time, we are all in the dark. And I truly hope that we could see the light together soon. I want to thank Dr. Simon Mills for coordinating and blessing me with this incredible opportunity. Daniel Modell for connecting the dots. And lastly, Governor David Patterson, I'd like to thank you for taking the time this afternoon and your service to the great people of the state of New York. Thank you for joining me, Governor Patterson. Thank you, and I'd like to thank Dr. Mills as well. Governor, where could folks find you? Where could they connect with you? Tell us when this book is coming out. So my email is DAP, my initials, David Alexander Patterson, DAPstrategies.llc at gmail.com. And the book will be out in early August, I believe. Otherwise, I can be reached at 646-276-2089, 646-276-2089. Why don't you give your home phone number out, Mr. President? Everyone listening, truly, I hope that this episode really resonated with you. Please pick up his book when it comes out. Will there be an audio version? I sure hope so. There will be real hell to pay from the disability community. Governor, thank you again. And to everyone listening, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Please, if you like this show, comment, subscribe, link, share it to everyone. To find out more, please visit www.thepodcast.com. Please remember to wash your hands, stay six feet apart, take care of each other, and catch us next week for another great episode of The Podcast. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Podcast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepodcast.com.